So you presented um, results of the mass study. And I think specifically for those of us who are urologists or radiation oncologists who treat um, a fair bit of low risk prostate cancer and consider the role of actor surveillance, this was a really highly anticipated study. We're always looking at ways to do um, secondary prevention. And so this study obviously looked at metformin and knows, you know, hoping you can maybe start us off with some of the rationale for why why you and the rest of the team chose to look at metformin as a, a secondary prevention for patients with uh, uh, low-risk prostate cancer undergoing surveillance. Yeah, so we've done quite a bit of work in Toronto about the use of metformin and retrospective and some prospective studies suggesting it had activity. So um, an immediate precursor to this, for example, we did a study looking at KI-67 in biopsies and then giving men metformin for their radical prostatectomy. And we saw a decrease in KI-67 by about 30%. Um, and so that was published. We saw um, in meta-analyses of sort of 3,000, 4,000 patients and improved survival with abiraterone, which had with a hazard ratio of um, 0. 0.8. Eight, uh, approximately um, in the CO1, 301, and 302 studies. Um, we saw a reduction in prostate cancer mortality in diabetic men, a hazard ratio of about 0.76 for every six months of metformin use um, whilst undergoing treatment for prostate cancer. And we also saw uh, a reduction in biochemical recurrence after radiotherapy in a retrospective cohort of nearly 600 men. Um, and there was also the lab data about it being an mTOR inhibitor and um, and the like. Um, and that was then complemented by work of others who had done um, retrospective analyses of SEER databases, um, as well as some preclinical work about the immune microenvironment and uh, its ability to overcome NKX 3.1 loss. Um, so there was, there was quite a bit of work, um, mostly retrospective, some prospective suggesting that metformin had activity. And we thought if it's going to work at all, then it should work in active surveillance. Right. And so maybe for those who are a little less familiar, um, the cohort of patients that was chosen here in the surveillance cohort, um, how does that compare, you know, overall, like, you know, how does it compare to the general population of men being diagnosed with prostate cancer? And, and are there differences between the, the cohort that, you know, gained enrollment into this study versus one that may be, you know, considered for active surveillance today in our practices or our clinics? Yeah, so the, the men who were enrolled were basically very low or low risk strata by NCCN. Um, and um, so in more detail, they had a diagnostic biopsy with at least 10 cores, um, less than a third of those cores were positive. Um, no more than 50% of any one core was positive and their Gleason score less than or equal to six. So generally speaking, those sort of criteria, I mean, it varies from institution to institution about what is uh, acceptable to put patients on, on, on active surveillance, but what is for sure is there was no Gleason 4 in this cohort. Um, some people do do that, um, but this was definitely a very pure NCCN, very low and low risk strata. Um, so that's probably the majority of men who go on active surveillance. Active surveillance after all, is just a means to um, most likely delay treatment um, ultimately, um, but it delays treatment without any side effects. So that's a win for the patient. Absolutely. And then, you know, among those men, you guys randomize patients to receive um, metformin or or just standard of care. Uh, and mm -hmm. I think followed a pretty That's standard, um, you know, surveillance approach with, you know, mandated biopsies, 18 months and three years. Um, I think there's a question that came up from Dr. Lerner at the, the presentation about confirmatory biopsies. And the way I saw it is I thought your 18 month biopsy kind of fit the, the confirmatory biopsy um, notion. Was that how, how it was intended or was this more to look for therapeutic effect of the, uh, the metformin? I know. So that was the 18 month biopsy was there to determine if they had pathological progression. He asked whether they had two biopsies to get onto study. So I guess the initial biopsy at St. Elsewhere's and then one biopsy at the big house but um, that was not practical. So men, um, if they had a biopsy that fit the criteria after review, then they got on the study. So, and then they had what is fairly a fairly routine active surveillance um, paradigm, which is biopsies at 18 months and 36 months. And it was placebo controlled. So um, uh, that offered some um, you know, objectivity about the data. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. And you followed patients for the endpoint of uh, time to progression. Can you maybe explain to us a little bit about how you guys consider progression and, and distinguish that therapeutic and um, pathological progression uh, endpoints? Yeah, so there were two endpoints, time to progression, either therapeutic, which was primary therapy for prostate cancer, and that could have been prostatectomy, radiation therapy, hormone therapy, focal therapy, proton beam therapy, whatever therapy the men had for their prostate cancer. And then pathological progression, which was um, a purer endpoint, um, which it was one of greater than one third of the total number of cores involved, at least 50% of any one core involved, or Gleason pattern four or higher. So um, that was a pure endpoint because people um, drop out of active surveillance for social reasons and other reasons, anxiety. Um, so the pathological progression is the pure endpoint. Right. And and maybe walk us through the results. What do we see with the um, use of uh, a couple of years of metformin in this active surveillance cohort? The th well, three years. So um, there was no difference. In fact, there was a trend that um, the patients on the placebo did better. So um, in the presentation, your viewers can see that the um, p-value and the hazard ratio for therapeutic and pathological progression together was... Um, the hazard ratio is 1.08 with a p-value of 0.6. Pathological progression alone, hazard ratio 1.07, p-value 0.69. And then therapeutic progression alone, 1.75 with a p-value of 0 0.05. Um, so um, that was, um, uh, I guess, disappointing. Um, but then there were some concerning findings, um, which was that the men who took metformin um, more, were more likely to, although not statistically more likely, but there was certainly a trend with the PVL of 0 0.08, have Gleason 8 disease or higher on their um, treatment. So that was about 13% versus 5% um, in the placebo arm. And then what was um, peculiar was that the men who had a BMI of greater than 30 did significantly worse on the metformin. Um, so there was an adjusted p-value for interaction of 0 0.03 and a p-value in men with a BMI greater than 30 for metformin versus placebo of 0 0.01 with a hazard ratio of 2.4. Hmm. So um, those curves significantly diverged um, at the 18-month time point. So um, that was um, uh, concerning. Uh, and mm -hmm. um, certainly, um, I think, will certainly speaks to the fact that you shouldn't be giving men metformin unless they're diabetic. Right. And do you, you know, do, do you or the group have hypotheses as to those um, sort of secondary and subgroup findings? Because I know, you know, when we think about secondary prevention with uh, five alpha reductase inhibitors, we think, you know, maybe the increased diagnosis of high grade prostate cancers, a better diagnostic sensitivity <laughs> of the test, right? We have some prostate cytoreduction reduction that comes from the five alpha reductase inhibitor. We can think through a mechanistic explanation. Is there any such explanation for these uh, findings with metformin or or is that yet to be sort of uh, elucidated yeah so yet yet to be elucidated um, um there's nothing obviously if we knew that there was a potential for what would appears to be harm we wouldn't have done the study in fact the, the patients with bmi greater than 30 exactly the ones we thought might benefit um so they would have their serum insulin reduced insulin can trigger testosterone signaling and contribute um so um at the moment, um, open to suggestions, um, we're working on a number of biomarker and genomic analyses to try and unravel that. Absolutely. And so, you know, if we look at today in 2024, where do you think we go with the notion of metformin? You know, prior to MAST, as you've well described, there's a great um, sort of preclinical rationale. There's good retrospective and prospective, but not randomized data. We have now a randomized trial that's negative. Is this the end of the road or is there more we can do um, down this path? And so there is one more big study coming, which is the Stampede study with the metformin arm. So that's going to be, as I understand it, presented at ESMO later this year, um, which is obviously for men with metastatic hormone sensitive disease. Um, so we'll await that data um, to see um, what, if anything, will happen. Absolutely. Uh, you know, it's always, we're always looking for the opportunity to repurpose medications and get some oncologic mm -hmm. benefit. You know, there's a lot of interest in um, uh, proton pump inhibitors and statins and a variety of other uh, medications. Do you think, 
you know, as we move forward, obviously, in active surveillance, as you alluded to, the idea of secondary prevention is very appealing. Are there other opportunities as you see it? Um, or or is this, um, you know, secondary prevention and surveillance uh, uh, a bit of a, a dead end currently? Well, you have to be extraordinarily careful because the men don't need actually any treatment. So if you're going to propose a treatment, it has to be something which is uh, almost side effect free that may have some other benefits to the men. So, you know, um, so th there's, you know, as you know, there's been studies of 5-alpha reductase inhibitors and even enzalutamide, um, which don't fit the bill of drugs, which have little or no side effects and the enzalutamide and the 5-alpha reductase studies were, the results were obviously concerning enough that they never hit prime time. So um, I don't know what the next drug would be. Um, they'd be tested in active surveillance. People are looking at nutraceuticals and all sorts of things. But this study took 10 years to accrue. Um, it's going to be challenging to envisage doing another large active surveillance study. It's not impossible to envisage doing another large active surveillance study. Um, but the paradigm has changed with the use of MRI scans and the like to suggest that we will have to integrate those into the workflow. So um, I don't know that anything is going to change the current treatment, um, but undoubtedly at some point in the future, there may be other drugs that would be used. I just don't know what they are right now. Absolutely. Totally fair. Well, we really appreciate you taking the time and sharing your insights. I think there's obviously a lot of interest both um, inside and outside the medical community about metformin as a, you know, a longevity related medication and, and a variety of other, um, you know, interests apart from its um, diabetic or hypoglycemic indication. And so I think um, there's a lot of interest, not just among urologists and prostate cancer physicians about the, the results of mass. And I appreciate you taking the time to, to share your insights with us today.